Good morning and welcome to our services here in Green Island and Ballycarry Presbyterian Church. It's great to have you following us online. This morning we're going to be uh, beginning to look at the covenants, uh, old and new, uh, the a couple of covenants in the Old Testament and how they blossom into the covenant in the New Testament. This morning we're starting with the old and next week we'll be looking at the new uh, it's exciting. They're, they're, it's great stuff. You know, I sound awfully dull. I know I sound dull as a minister. Oh, how exciting are the covenants? But genuinely, they're great and it's good to get into them. So we'll be doing that in our reading and in our address this morning. We've got a couple of announcements before we move into worship. Uh, big announcement for Ballycarry. Now, this is for the members of Ballycarry Presbyterian. We will be hearing the candidate for the uh, for the minister in Ballycarry uh, Presbyterian Church, uh, and he will be speaking on the eighteenth of October, in both the morning service and the evening service. So this is the official announcement that a candidate for the vacancy in Ballycarry will be heard on the eighteenth of October. It will be the same service in the morning as it is in the evening, and that's to enable as many voting members as possible to come along to one or other service, not both, uh, to hear the candidate. There will then be a congregational meeting in the church and the halls on the 19th of October. And that is when the vote will take place. So if you're not familiar with the system, we will hear the candidate on the 18th, and then we meet in the congregational meeting on the 19th, at seven o'clock in the parish halls uh, to make our decisions about how we want to move forward with that vacancy. Uh, we can choose not to move forward or we can choose to move forward. We can choose to call the candidate to be heard or we can choose not to call the candidate to be heard. Uh, it is up to you as a church to make the decisions moving forward on the next minister in Ballycarry. Nobody else's. Uh, and this is a congregational responsibility. So we would encourage those that feel able, and hear that, those that feel able to sign into one of the church services on the 18th and to be at the congregational meeting for the voting on the 19th. Uh, and other announcements in Green Island Presbyterian Church, our incredible magazine is here. This is our October to December, our sort of autumn into winter edition. Um, there's just lots of great stuff in this. Um, I kind of thought it'd be a quiet season with it being locked down and COVID, uh, but apparently there's been lots going on. So this will be coming out to all the members of Green Island Presbyterian Church uh, for them to catch up on what's been happening around the church, particularly in this season. We continue to collect for cap at the doors, at the side doors of Green Island Presbyterian as well. Uh, and we continue to be encouraged by the great provision uh, brought up and given to cap through that. As we move into worship, there's this little bit in the book of Micah, Micah chapter 4, and Micah has some great things regarding the kingdom of God. But there's almost this sort of sense that when people turn their hearts to God, this is what will happen. And he paints us this image. And I suppose in these days, I would love our churches and our nation and our, and our earth to be turning its hearts to God so we can see these things come about. So as we as we turn our hearts to him in worship this morning, uh, gathered online, gathered in our churches, let us hear these words. In the days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be raised up above the hills. People shall stream to it and many nations, nations shall come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth instruction and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between many peoples and shall arbitrate between strong nations far away. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. Isn't that what we want to see happen? But that happens when people turn their hearts to him and honour him and worship him. And it says here, and walk in his paths. Well, let's begin that as we turn our hearts towards him and our worship this morning 
as we gather and we sing to him with these words. Jesus, we enthrone you. We proclaim you our King. Standing here in the midst of us, we raise you up with our reading is going to be from the book of Genesis it's chapter 17 and we're going to read the first 11 verses of that uh, following our reading we will be having our prayers of intercession but let us move into God's word and hear what he has for us this morning Genesis chapter 17 beginning at verse 1 when Abram was 99 years old the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. And I will make a covenant between me and you. And I will make you exceedingly numerous. Then Abram fell on his face and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You shall be the ancestor of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, but you shall be called Abraham. For I have made you the ancestor of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you, and your offspring after you throughout the generations. For an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land which you are now an alien. All the land of Canaan for a perpetual holding and I will be their God. God said to Abram, as for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your offspring after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. 
Amen. We pray that God will teach us and speak to us through his word this morning. But now let us move into prayer. Let us bow our heads. Heavenly Father, I'm not sure if many of us could have imagined or foreseen the chaos coming in America with President Trump being diagnosed with COVID and being moved to a hospital. My Father, what we see is a huge amount of uncertainty coming into the heart of one of the largest governments in the world. My Father reminds us this morning of the importance of praying for government particularly in times of difficulty and crisis like this. So Father, this morning we do want to pray for the health of our leaders. We want to pray for their health physically, spiritually and emotionally. We want you through the power of your spirit to move upon our world leaders, Father, enabling them to do their jobs physically and emotionally but also leading them, Father, in the way of morality and goodness, in the way of righteousness and integrity, in the way of wisdom and discernment. And we pray that over our own government. We pray that over the American leadership. And we pray it over, Father, some governments in our world who have been maybe short of all of those elements. Father, we want to pray for our government at this time, and particularly as it leads and makes difficult decisions in regard to finance and jobs and livelihoods. We want to pray for our Chancellor, that he is wise and you give him foresight, Father. Heavenly Father, we want to pray for our government as they seek to fund and provide their resources for our health service. Be with our health minister and his team as they seek to supply all that our health service needs in order to meet the difficult demands of this time. Heavenly Father, we want to pray for our schools and our communities and how our government leads on these, through the Education Authority, the Department of Education. And again, Father, we want to see decisions coming out that are clear and easily understood. We want to see our parents and our teachers and our principals being in a position where the direction from government is clear and straightforward so that we can all get on board together so that we can all be doing the same things in this season heavenly father it is so difficult because we are seeing leaders in government becoming patients and being affected by this virus. So Father, as we pray for our government, we pray for their protection. We pray that you will look after them and care for them. Because when our governments struggle and come under strain through COVID to MPs and to presidents and to PMs, what we see is difficulty appear throughout the whole country and uncertainty. So, Father, as we close our prayers, we ask you to protect those in government. We ask you to protect those that lead us. Amen.
said before, one of the great privilege you, privileges you have as a minister is getting to take part in weddings. Now when I say that I don't mean but it also is a nice side effect that you get the opportunity to eat lots of great food in lots of great fancy hotels. What I mean by that rather is that you get to take part in services where two people commit their lives to one another. It's great Pamela and Keith are here. I should have thrown a picture of their wedding up. They were the last wedding we did just a couple of weeks ago there. And to use some classic language, they say that in the good and the bad, in sickness and in health, that these two people will love one another, support one another, carry one another. And in these days, we just see more and more couples writing their own wedding vows. Which is great. They want to choose the language of commitment. They want to shape the words of commitment to be as personal uh, as possible to themselves as a couple. Because these words of commitment are important. These words shape the wedding contract, if you will. These words are what you commit to. So what they contain... Are important. Interestingly, in commitment terms, these wedding vows are the only Christian commitment that we see between one person and another. What we see in a wedding is a covenant relationship being formed. By that I mean a commitment made by two parties whereby which, which talks about or shapes how they will act towards one another. But while we in the church see this as the only human-to-human covenant, if you will, in a wedding, what we see throughout Scripture is a developing covenant relationship, but not between two people, but between God and people. God and people making commitment to one another that defines and shapes that relationship. Now I'm going to use Wayne Grudem's definition of God's covenant with us, though I've modified the language slightly. That's just in case he's watching. You know, that big American theologian who's watching our YouTube series. So I just wanted to clarify that. I think different emphasis is needed. So this is our definition, our working definition this morning. So a covenant is an unchangeable, divinely instigated agreement between God and a person or persons that stipulates the conditions of that relationship. Straight again, a covenant is an unchangeable, divinely instigated agreement between God and a person or persons that stipulates the conditions of that relationship. Now, for clarity, like say a will, it is unchangeable, but it can be replaced. And we say it is divinely instigated because God sets the terms of the covenant. But on free will, we can choose to accept that covenant or reject it. That's our choice. And we'll be familiar with several of these biblical covenants and how they develop. And we're going to consider some of the Old Testament covenants this week. And next week, I was just saying, we'll move on and look at that idea of the new covenant in Christ. And how does this marry, this idea of covenant, how does that marry into us looking at theology and things like the fall? 
Well, theology at its very heart is trying to understand who God is, who we are, and what is our relationship to God. That's the basic guts of theology. And covenants, by their nature, speak to the relationship between these two creatures, God and us, that theology is trying to understand. And what they actually do is these covenants reveal something to us about who God is and who we are. And we'll consider that as we go through. This morning also fits well, having just studied creation and the fall, because the very first instance of a covenant is found actually in the Garden of Eden. Theologians like to attach several names to it, but we'll simply call it the covenant of works this morning. God makes a contract or an agreement with Adam and Eve. He says, you manage, you maintain, you control the garden, and you will flourish. And we will be in perfect relationship. But if you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will die. That's the contract. That's the agreement. You look after the garden and you'll do well. But if you do this, if you, do, if you disobey this commandment, you will suffer. And at the root of most covenants, and we need to recognize this, lies obedience to God. Although we will hear later on how much covenants show what God thinks about us in in love and, and passion, we always got to recognize that the nature of a covenant is that both sides have to uphold part of the agreement. And in our relationship with God, that's almost obedience to, almost always obedience to his word. So he says to Adam and Eve, the whole garden is yours to enjoy, but you must obey and not eat of the fruit of the tree. While they obey, they enjoy a full unbroken relationship with God. But if they break that covenant, then there will be consequences. And the consequence is that that relationship will become broken. That's the covenant of works as we see in the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve work the garden. And you will flourish. Moving forward, we see next the, the Noah covenant, if you will. This is slightly different because in this covenant, nothing is asked of Noah. Or indeed ourselves. It's simply a covenant promise where all the activity is in God's side. In that he enters into a contract with us, saying that he will not bring about such a cleansing of the earth again. If he is going to interact with us, God says it will not be in such a devastating manner ever again to the earth. So that's the Noah covenant. And then we come to really, this is the beginning. This is the daddy of covenants. And I'm going to call it, this is purely my own language, we're going to call it the universal covenant This is where we find God entering into a relationship with Adam, sorry, not Adam, Abraham that we read this morning. And this covenant relationship begins in Genesis 12, where God says, I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. And then this covenant unpacking finalizes itself in Genesis 17 that we read. Where God says, I am God Almighty. And he moves through the language. I will establish, establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you in their generations. For an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. Now when you read through those passages from 12 to 17, you pick up a couple of things. One is there's a sense of blessing within this covenant language. There's the language of fruitfulness. The goal of the covenant is not in some way to wrap you up into some kind of do what God says or you'll get hit with a hammer. It's actually the opposite. The language is the covenant that if, if, if we are in a relationship together, that you will be fruitful, that you will, be, that you will flourish the very first bit of the language in in Genesis 12, it says this, if Adam will walk before the Lord blamelessly, then God will see that he is fruitful and that he will be a blessing to others. 
So in the covenant there is an action towards God. By us. And there's an action towards us. By God. I will be your God. And we will be his people. And he asks something of us in this covenant relationship. That we walk with him and are blameless. If we obey this direction of God. To walk with him and obey him. Then we will be fruitful. Then we will flourish. Then we will be blessed. And on to this God adds a sign that will mark his people out as his. And this will become important next week again. You know, we read that the sign will be circumcision. And in the sense of this universal covenant, what we, what we read is, if you pop back the last screen, nothing. Okay, what we read there is that this is an everlasting covenant. This is an, the, the covenant made with Abraham is an everlasting covenant. He will always be our God. And we will always be his people if we walk with him. And this universal covenant as we understand it. It comes up, or, comes up over and over again in scripture. You know even in the messianic prophecies that we see in Jeremiah. We see this quoted. I will be your God and you will be my people. You will flourish if you walk with me. But if you don't, you will struggle. So we have this everlasting universal covenant that is made with Abraham. But the covenant journey continues and we come to the Sinai covenant with Moses. Now the principle of the Abrahamic covenant is in place. We see that with, with, with the people, and it's actually quoted as the people are getting ready to leave Egypt, and as Moses, in fact, is being sent to Egypt, the language of the covenant with Abraham is there. You know, I am their God. They are my people. But what we see progressing here is much more of a shaping up of the action that the people must be following to walk blamelessly with God. Moses gives them the law Sorry, God gives Moses the law on Sinai, most famously the still the Ten Commandments. And it develops in the sacrificial system to deal with our failure in face of the law. So what we have now, and this, this is important, we have the sign of the covenant, which is circumcision. And then we have the covenant action, which is obedience to the law as given to Moses in Sinai. And the sign and the action become important next week as well. But the problem we have here is we know that we cannot keep this covenant with God. God is ever faithful towards us. He always has been. He always will be. It, it would be to deny his nature for him not to be. So he upholds his side of the covenant completely. But we recognize our failure in face of the law and the old testament lamented the fact that the temple could not deal with the fall as it infects us all through adam but while we cannot keep the law and the temple cannot fully deal with our sin what we actually find here is is a foreshadowing of christ who would never fall to sin and whose sacrificial death would deal with the stain of adam once and for all And of note, what we find here is when the Gospels and the New Testament talk about the New Covenant, getting rid of the Old Covenant, it's this Moses Covenant that we're talking about, this legal covenant that would always fail. It's not the Abrahamic one that is everlasting where it says, I will be my God and you will be my people. That's not what's got rid of. The new covenant fulfills that. What the, new co what the new covenant gets rid of is this legal, sacrificial framework. The bit that cannot be kept on our side, no matter how hard we try. So we have this series of agreements, promises, contracts that God makes with people or persons in the scriptures. And most importantly is that these covenants are never just for one person at one time. What we see is that they are for everyone 
in all times. The stress that we see when God talks to Abraham is that it is for his descendants. And what we learn from them is how God wants to relate to us. And one of the things that we can affirm right from the off is that God does want to relate to us. God does want to be in relationship with us. Even in the fall, God wants to continue to be with us. Now, we always read this in hindsight, so we can't imagine anything different. But I want to imagine in your head, would it really have been that odd, a story, if God had removed Adam and Eve from the garden and then wanted nothing more to do with them? Would that have really have been that unreasonable? Certainly if we look at the understanding of the gods around Israel at the time, the Roman gods, the Greek gods, the pagan gods, you know, they were quite seen as quite fickle in relationship. It would have been wholly unsurprising if they had cast their people out and turned their back on them and said, I don't want anything to do with you again. But not Yahweh, not the God of Israel. Even outside of Eden, he continues to seek relationship with us. And what kind of relationship does he seek with us? Well, he seeks to be in a relationship in which we are fruitful, in which we are blessed, where we can multiply and know peace and prosperity. That's why Abraham has promised the land of Canaan, because it's the most fertile, rich, lush country in that territory. He promises Abraham this land that his ancestors can enjoy, that his descendants will flourish in. And I love the language he, he says to, to Abraham that his ancestors will be like grains of sand on the beach or like stars in the sky. So we realize that these ancestors of Abraham, there are going to be millions and millions and millions. And what we actually begin to realize is that God is talking about us. And God makes a covenant because even in the fall, he wants us to do well and be blessed and to flourish. Even in this broken world that we looked at over the past couple of weeks, he wants the best for us. You know, what's that passage that is frequently quoted? I will never leave you, God says, nor forsake you. Well, that's God basically saying that he will always uphold his side of the covenant. It reflects his side of the universal covenant that he formed with us. I will be your God and you will be my people. My own, God says, I draw you to myself. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. This is what the covenants reaffirm. God constantly moving towards us. You know, when you hear people who maybe have done some terrible things and they say, God couldn't want someone like me. Or you see people with a broken sense of themselves and say, God couldn't love someone like me. And yet the entire language of covenant, old and new, says that these things are lies. Because God's covenants are the language of God's pursuit of us. And when the circumcision and the law are not enough, he sends something greater. A greater covenant for us to be part of. A greater expression of his passage, his passion and his love for us. The new covenant written in the blood of Christ. We'll unpack that next week. But what we must see now in this week, even in the Old Testament language, is that God has actively pursued us even after the fall. He has actively pursued us through the centuries, millennia even. And in that pursuit, he continues to promise us that if we walk with him, if we let him be our God, then he will draw close and he will see us flourish in the fullest, not the financial, in the fullest sense of that word. You kind of realize, I don't know, whether you've become dull or enlightened, because you kind of think, how exciting are the covenants? How exciting are the covenants? That's the key to a single man's status. If you meet a girl and you say, what are you passionate about? Oh, the covenants. I'm passionate about the covenants. It's like, oh, not reading and going for long walks then. No, the covenants. But we should be passionate about them. 
because they inform us about how God thinks of us and how God wants to relate to us. And in fact, we may read the covenant and may say, yes, but one side of it is a stick to you. One side is, is that God's saying, if you obey, it will go badly for you. But God is simply unpacking a reality. If we don't follow his direction, which is for us to flourish, then the opposite must happen. That we will struggle. The covenants are exciting. In the same way that covenant promises in a marriage are exciting. In marriage, we make covenant promises to one another as an expression of our love and commitment towards one another. God does no less towards us. These promises are his love letters to us, if you will, telling us how he feels about us and what he wants from us, about the relationship he wants to be in with us. And do you know what's incredible about them? Because I, I made vows to funeral when we got married, and I know that I have, I have train crashed them over and over and over again. Stop nodding. I know that I've done that. But in these covenant promises with God, what we know is that he has not broken his promises towards us. He has never failed. He will never forsake. He will never abandon. How stunning to hear these covenant words this morning. Amen. Faithful one, so unchanging, ageless one, you're my rock of peace, Lord.
close our service with the words of the benediction that we may say to one another online. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen.